this morning I, and, and yesterday, the last several days, I, I feel like God has been speaking what could be multiple sermons into my heart, into my mind, and it's like multiple work streams that are all still somewhat in process, and it almost feels like there's a, a download that's still sinking, uh, not that I'm feeling swamped by it, but excited for what God is, is doing inside of me and, and doing inside of this body, and it's so multifaceted, and, and but even with all that, as I've been reading and studying and praying, I, I felt yesterday that there was one message that seemingly rose to the surface and kind of took a step forward, and I'm grateful for the Spirit of God that is still directing his church. I know I play a role, but I, Lord, I, I can't do this without you. And so this morning, our message could be considered part two of last Sunday morning's message, which was entitled, The Priesthood of All Believers. And so if you'd stand with me, and if, if you'd turn in your Bibles to our opening text in Acts chapter eight, starting in verse 14. And if you have a, a little piece of paper or a, a way to mark Acts chapter eight, we're gonna, we're gonna camp out here this morning in Acts chapter eight, verse 14. And, and in this opening text, we're actually jumping into the middle of a story a story that describes what God was doing in Samaria, a city that is outside of Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 8, verse 14, it says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Peter and John, who when they were come down from Jerusalem to Samaria, they prayed for them a very specific prayer. They prayed that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he, God dwelling in these temples made without hands, he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. This morning, God wants to do the same, to reproduce himself in us. Would you pray with me and would you ask the Lord to speak to us here in Racine just like he spoke to the church in Samaria? Lord, let it be our prayer this morning. If there's more for us, let us be open to it, God. And Lord, let your spirit... Have liberty, God, and let your truth go forward, Lord. Let us receive it and let it be enacted in our lives, not just in theory, but in practice, God. Let us experience the power of your spirit working. These signs will follow them that believe. We ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Peter and John, they, they had traveled some 70 miles from Jerusalem to Samaria with a very specific purpose. They, they came to pray for some newly baptized believers, believers that, who had not yet received the Holy Ghost. These believers were baptized in water, but the Spirit of God had not yet fallen on them, according to the Scriptures. And while we have plenty to unpack around the events that led up to this and the events that followed this, this trip that Peter and John took to Samaria, there, there's a somewhat coincidental parallel of the season that we are in as a church here in Racine. And I'd like to make this declaration to you up front. You might be here this morning, a believer that has been baptized, and yet the Holy Ghost has not yet fallen on you. When Peter and John preached to these believers about the infilling of the Holy Ghost, like I'm gonna share with you this morning, those who believed, received. If they believed the word of God, they were filled like the scriptures say. And this morning, make no mistake, God wants to fill 
every individual, every believer with his spirit, to have his name called over them in the waters of baptism is not an exclusive club for just a few. These signs shall follow them that believe the priesthood of all believers. We've all been called into this service in the kingdom of God, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And this morning, before we can move forward, we we need to actually take a, a few steps back to read the chapters prior to what we just read to connect some dots. And so if you turn in your Bibles with me, Next to Acts chapter one, verse four. Here we, we want to connect to two specific dots that we'll then see later intersect with chapter eight. The first point, or the first dot, is a promise that Jesus made to all the believers that there would come a day when they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost. The second point, or the second dot that we want to connect here is in reference to Samaria, where Jesus told his followers that after they received this promise of the Holy Ghost, that they would have power to be witnesses and that they would be witnesses specifically in a place that they had not been witnesses in Samaria. And so reading what led up to or what preceded Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4, it says that here Jesus, who was being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Note the people of God were imagining a very different outcome, a very different kingdom than what Jesus had been telling them was coming. In the moment in time, they didn't understand, they couldn't have understood what it was exactly that was the promise of the Father that they were to wait for in Jerusalem. They imagined it was a, an overthrow of the Roman Empire, but that's not what Jesus was going to grant them, this gift. Jesus then goes on to answer the question, is, it, is this the time that we're waiting for? Is this the overthrow of the Roman Empire? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But he restates the promise, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth based on their response to Jesus' promise of the Holy Ghost, they, they really didn't understand what he was talking about. They didn't understand, like many of us didn't understand the promises of God while we had a belief in God. In fact, an encounter with God, there was still more to experience than what maybe we have experienced as of yet. And I remember for myself, um, growing up in a church, growing up uh, believing in God, believing in the Bible, somehow these scriptures that we point to so frequently, um, they, they never spoke to me about this promise or, or it was never pointed out to me. I was never taught that there was more to experience in God. And like most every one of us, when we were first told or, or heard about the Holy Ghost, most of us nodded our heads, but didn't really understand. There's more? I don't know. I, I can't comprehend. I haven't experienced such a thing. And perhaps even when we were asked, would you like to receive the Holy Ghost? Sure. <laughs> Could have been our response. But in our hearts, we're like, I'm not sure what that's all about. Right. This is what was taking place in Samaria. Perhaps we were even slightly confused at that kind of a question. I know that as I've asked that question to others, I've gotten that kind of um, uncertain response, the response that says, well, what do you mean I don't I already have it? Well, have you ever had the experience of speaking other tongues, as the Bible says, is the, is the initial evidence of being filled with spirit? Well, no, I've never had that experience, but I was taught as a young child that You know, if I just believe in God, then his spirit is with me. Or if I was baptized as a child, his spirit is with me. Or if I just accept Jesus Christ as my savior, his spirit is with me. And and I was one of those. That's what I was taught as well. And so I understand 
the place of uncertainty. But here's the good news. Belief is the starting point for every step of obedience. If if you didn't believe, you wouldn't likely be here this morning. And so I'm going to take the the fact that you do believe, that there is a trust and an understanding that God is real and that there are promises for you in his word and that even if we don't fully understand them all, there's an opportunity for more. Hmm. I remember that night when God filled me, that Sunday, when God filled me with his spirit. I, I can tell you with com- confidence that I didn't understand anything about any of it at all. But that didn't somehow stop God from filling me with his spirit. Amen. It was some 28 years ago on September 1st. And at that time, I didn't understand what it meant to be baptized. I, I knew what it meant to go down in the water, but I didn't know that you could also be baptized with the Holy Ghost. But that didn't stop God from pouring out his spirit into this vessel. And I, I had heard a little bit about speaking in tongues, and I had certainly by this time, just being around all of you, heard some of you pray in a language that didn't make any sense to me, but I didn't understand what it was. And I certainly didn't understand that, that God had a desire for me to have that same experience, but my lack of understanding didn't stop any of it from happening. As you'll see in our story about the church that was birthed in Samaria, God is is much more concerned about the condition of the heart than the condition of our mind and the condition of our understanding. It's true, we all need to to learn what the scriptures say and understand what the plan of salvation is and, and, and to grab a hold of all the promises of God. We have to, to go to his word for that, but there are t- moments in time in our walk with God when uh, we may just be able to take a few steps without that understanding, that the spirit of God can be manifested in our lives without fully comprehending the Bible, and I thank God for that. All he really needs is a willing vessel, an open door, the Bible says he stands at the door and knocks, just waiting for someone to open. You don't have to understand everything that's on the other side of that door to open the door this morning. If we could take just a few more moments to connect dots to the message from last Sunday morning. Last Sunday morning, we finished that message entitled The Priesthood of All Believers, speaking about what happened on the day of Pentecost, how that first message that Peter preached when he told all the people that had gathered around that they were to repent, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins, and that they would receive the promise of the Holy Ghost. And if you were here, we we talked about the logistics of what would have had to have taken place for 3,000 people to be added to the church in one day, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And while the Bible doesn't specifically spell it out, how 3,000 were baptized all on the same day, I I shared my opinion, my view, that they didn't wait in 12 long lines to be baptized by one of the 12 apostles. I believe those newly born again saints quickly reproduced themselves as they had an experience with God through his spirit, and they responded to the word that Peter preached, and then they shared it with somebody else, and then they responded, and there was a great outpouring, a, a great adding to the church empowered by the Holy Ghost, the priesthood of all believers started to take a step in operation. And so just like at the end of last Sunday's message, if you were here, you recall I asked each of you as priests to find someone to pray with, releasing one another to step into that role that God has called his church, his saints to fill. And at the end of the service, we're gonna do something similar, praying with one one another to be filled with the Holy Ghost because it's a promise to every believer. And last Sunday, I gave the instruction as men praying with men and ladies praying with other ladies, keeping in mind that the only pre-qualification to pray is that you believe, because why would you pray except you believe? Do we have any believers here this morning? Let me ask that again. Do we have any believers here this morning? If you believe, the Bible says, these signs shall follow you. All those who believe, it's the signature of God's power operating through the priesthood of all believers to to teach men and women to repent, to baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ, to allow the infilling of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God 
speaks to every believer, laying hands even on the sick and praying for them that they shall recover in the name of Jesus Christ. I remember that Sunday when I had that first experience that I could not have explained to you. I, I wasn't even baptized at the time. These Samaritans, they were, they were more qualified than I was to receive God's spirit. <laughs> I wasn't even baptized, but I, I remember that Sunday as I came up to the altar, there was a, a repentance that took place. <laughs> I'm sure my words weren't eloquent. Uh, I'm sure they weren't spoken very loudly, but I did remember the remorse that I felt and the desire for a savior and, and in fact, that, that Sunday morning, I remember, without even taking any action, without ever coming up to the front, uh, I remember just thinking, God, I think I want to do what's right. That, I didn't say it. I didn't raise my hand and confess it. I didn't, I didn't take any steps or actions. I just thought it. And that Sunday night when I came back to church, God had already read my mind. And when it came to the end of the service, when the preacher invited everyone to come up front like we do every service, as I started to take a step forward, if, if you would have asked me why was I going forward, I couldn't have explained it. All I could have possibly told you was, I just feel like I need to go up front. I don't know why. I don't have a specific agenda in mind. I don't have even an intent. I didn't, I didn't leave my spot in the back pew to walk forward to even repent but when I got to the front there was something that started to happen that I now know as repentance <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't come with that intent I certainly didn't come that Sunday with a plan in mind let me tell you at the end of the service if you feel that same tug let me tell you that's God that's tugging on your heart <laughs> don't allow logic to circumvent what God is trying to do you don't even need to know what to expect in order to respond to that tugging. You don't have to know what the Bible says to take steps forward in response to the word of God. Just trust that it's God who is prompting you. And maybe, maybe you'll pray that simple prayer. God, if there's, there's more for me, then I want to experience it. You know what? We could, we could all pray that prayer right now. Let's do that right now. God, if there's more for me, I want to experience it. God loves those kind of prayers. God, if there's more for me to understand, I want to, I want to understand it. Will you show it to me in your word? God, if there's more evidence for me, I want to have that evidence, that confidence. Yes. God wants you to have that confidence. Not wonder, am I saved? Have I had a real experience with him? Turning back to Acts chapter 8, we start in verse 1 to connect more dots now. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. This is speaking of the death of Stephen, the first martyr of that New Testament church that was birthed in an upper room. And at that time, there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Everyone scattered except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Saul was so committed to stamp out the fire of Pentecost that was in Jerusalem, but the more he tried to stamp it out, the more it just spread. The more the name of Jesus and the power of his spirit was experienced in a wider audience because of that persecution. You know, even when it feels like everything is going wrong, it may actually be going right. The church felt like, how could this be, Lord? We've just been born again. We've just been born of the water, born of the spirit. We've had this incredible experience. Signs and wonders are following us. And now we're being persecuted to the point where we have to disperse out of, out of our homeland, out of Jerusalem, out of our, our comfort zone, out of our, away from our neighbors, away from our family. Yes, even when everything seems like it's wrong, it may actually be right because now the word of God is gonna be expanded past just Jerusalem, past just the Jews. Yes. 
I wonder if in this modern day and age, in these last days even, that God doesn't have a similar plan. That the conditions that are right for revival will look not like the conditions we would have imagined. At this time, the church was being thrown into jail for their stand for Jesus Christ. And, and so Philip, he travels some 70 miles north of Jerusalem to Samaria. It's a little unclear whether Philip was there primarily to spread the message of Jesus or if he was really there simply because he was hiding out, keeping his distance from the persecution that was taking place in Jerusalem. Either way, Samaria was not likely Philip's first choice of a place to either minister or a place to hide because the Jews and the Samaritans were as culturally divided as two ethnic groups could have possibly been at that time. To understand this cultural divide, we have to understand a little bit about the history of the Samaritans. The Samaritans themselves were descendants of the nation of Israel. But when the rest of the Israelites were exiled, the group that was left behind intermarried with non-Jews. And that was the beginning of the rift between the Jews and the Samaritans, which only grew worse that after the Jews returned from exile, during which was the time of Nehemiah when he sought to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, it was the Samaritans who opposed this work, as we read in Nehemiah chapter 6. Another reason that the Jews despised Samaritans was that they had built their own temple on Mount Gerizim, and they had claimed it as the right place to worship instead of the temple that was in Jerusalem. Another offense between two culturally divided groups. Samaria and its inhabitants were looked down upon by the Jews, in part because Samaria had become a place of refuge for all Judean outlaws. Samaria willingly received the Jewish criminals and refugees, people who had violated Jewish laws, found safety in Samaria, which greatly increased the hatred between the two groups. While both had faith that was based on the law of Moses, the Samaritans accepted only the five books of Moses and rejected the writings of the prophets. And so these all were contributing factors to the cultural divide between the Samaritans and the Jews. In part, I want to call your attention to this within this narrative because there's some parallels that I see even in the world that's around us in the denominal world that exists. Christianity at large, as I often refer to it, to understand that like the Jews and Samaritans, there was a common foundation. Uh, so many denominations hold up the same Bible as the, the plan of salvation and the word, the inspired word of God, but yet there was still a great cultural divide between them even though they, they held the same foundation. But when God was ready to extend full truth, they were ready to receive it, the Samaritans, and someone had to build a bridge to fill the gap, to take that first step. I wonder if the church of the living God is ready to be the people that God uses to build a bridge to those who have some version of what we understand, people that God has chosen, called, prepared, built a foundation in. Turning once again to Acts chapter 8, Starting in verse 5, we continue to, to follow this story. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many, taken with palsies, and them that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. There was a response, not just from a, a select few, but a whole community recognized there was a transformation that was going on. People were healed and evil spirits were cast out because these signs shall follow the priesthood of all believers. There is a power and an authority and a witness that God wants to make in this world through his church. And within this group of people living in Samaria, verse 9 speaks to one particular man named Simon. He's most often known as Simon the sorcerer. Now, to be, to be frank, it's a little unclear what kind of sorcery he practiced. Because the Greek word here used for sorcery is only used once, but it's based on the root word for mangos, which is the same word that describes the magi, you know, the wise men that followed the star to find that newborn king. And so some commentaries on Simon the sorcerer have suggested that he was maybe less a worker of, 
of evil magic through the help of fallen angels and more like a religious con man. Someone who fooled the city of Samaria into believing that he was, in fact, a man of God who, in reality, faked having great power and authority. So reading for ourselves, if you turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 9, here's the account that says, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery or, or deception, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that of himself that he himself was some great one. There, there's a red flag right there. Anyone who proclaims themselves great, that's, that's reason to, to give caution to their words. Verse 10 says, To whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is a great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Verse 12 says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were the city of Samaria, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself, Simon the sorcerer, one of the Samaritans, believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Now, as we try to, to consider who was this Simon and what was, what was the nature of what he was doing, it, it really doesn't change the outcome of the story. But I see two small pieces of evidence in favor of Simon that, that point to perhaps that he was a manipulator as a religious leader who kept some form of Moses' law along with the rest of the Samaritans who held on to some of their old customs mix, mixed with some customs that were not of God. And I say that because, number one, the people he misled believed Simon to be a great man of, or a great power of God. And so they weren't ascribing his power to something fallen. And number two, seeing that Simon joined the Jesus movement, he was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ along with the other Samaritans who believed the message that Philip, Philip preached, a message that was confirmed with signs and wonders. And so it's unclear, did he denounce something in order to do that or did he simply add to his collection or theatrics it doesn't say that he didn't believe to be baptized he just was baptized along with everyone else and so again belief is the starting point otherwise why would we take any action and while the bible only tells us that philip preached jesus christ that's the that's the extent of the definition and as a result of preaching jesus christ many signs and miracles occurred it doesn't feel like a stretch of the imagination that when Philip preached Christ, he preached the same message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, to repent, to be baptized, and to be filled with the promise of the Holy Ghost. But as we read on, while the Samaritans saw the miraculous healings, while they, they saw the signs that were being worked, in their response to the message that Philip had brought, in, they had only experienced two of the three ingredients required to be born again. They had repented and they had been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, born of the water, but not yet born of the Spirit. Not as of yet. Here's another parallel with the day and age that we live in. There's a significant portion of Christians that fall into a very similar category, having experienced some portion of the promises of God, but not having yet fully been born, born again, born of the water and born of the spirit, like Jesus told Nicodemus, except you be born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. You can't enter into it. That which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say you must be born again. God has a newness of life that he intends for every believer. And as we read in our opening text in Acts chapter eight, verses 14 through 17, the apostles heard that Samaria had repented and that Samaria had been baptized. And so they sent reinforcements with Peter and John who, who came ready to pray them through, to help them have the faith to take the steps to receive the promises of the Holy Ghost. Verse 
Now, as I, as I studied and prepared and, and contemplated this message, this is right here is where I paused and I started to ask the Lord to help me understand. Well, why did the Samaritans need someone other than Philip to pray them through, to lay hands on them as they prayed words of faith, faith that opened the door for God's spirit to move in so that they too could be filled with the Holy Ghost? As I contemplated that question, I, I tried to imagine scenarios. Perhaps one scenario is, was it the Samaritans who, who just needed to be ministered to in some different way, right? The Bible speaks of the fivefold ministry and that sometimes if we try to accomplish everything on our own, we are missing parts of what God's plan is for his church. Amen. Perhaps that, that is a scenario that was in play here. Or, or maybe, maybe it was Philip. Maybe Philip somehow lacked something. You know, sometimes uh, our faith is limited based on the experiences that we've had, and then as we have more experiences, our belief and trust in God is easier to put into action. Faith is the evidence of that belief and trust. I can tell you, having seen and prayed with many, many, many individuals that have received the Holy Ghost, it is easy for me to believe that you can receive it. I don't have to trust that God wants to give it to you because I've seen him pour it out time and time and time again. Right. But if you've never experienced that, well, then it'll be a little bit harder for you to trust and believe, even if you've experienced it yourself. Right. But as we grow and mature, our trust and belief grows with it. And with that, our faith is demonstrated. And I don't believe Philip was someone who lacked faith. There's no evidence that suggests that. In fact, later, this is Philip the deacon the one that was one of the seven, along with Steph, Stephen, that was appointed to look over the church business. And, and when the persecution came, he departed for Samaria. And later, he's referred to as Philip the Evangelist. And so I don't believe that he was lacking faith because God was working great signs and miracles through his ministry as he preached Jesus Christ to them. But for some reason, they just weren't filled with the Holy Ghost. So was it that Samaria needed to be ministered somehow differently by the fivefold ministry? Was it because Philip was lacking something? Perhaps, likely not. Or, or was it the apostles who had doubts about the Samaritans? Doubts that their potential, or doubts about their potential to be converted. Again, I'm just imagining since these scenarios. I'm not telling you this is the fact, but perhaps God withheld part of the new birth experience causing Peter and John to, to come in person to see the outpouring to confirm the works and the signs that followed. Now, we can have a lot of questions. God doesn't owe us an answer to every question that we might have, but as I was praying and I asked God for insight, I can't say that the Lord gave me any specific direct answer, but if I had to pick one of those scenarios, that latter one seems to have some merit. I don't believe Philip was lacking anything. The Bible says that those deacons were chosen because they were of an honest report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And so it wasn't because he hadn't experienced the Holy Ghost for himself. And I believe it could be this latter scenario because unbelief in any form will stop the flow of God's spirit, even if that unbelief is coming from the saints of God, saints who had unbelief that the Samaritans themselves could be saved and keeping in mind that this took place before even the Gentiles received the same promise and the same gift. And so this was exclusively a Jewish club, and the Samaritans were somewhat less than Jewish. It wasn't until Acts chapter 10 when the Jews were still questioning Peter when he tried to explain how the Holy Ghost was poured out on the house of Cornelius as that first non-Jew Gentile was having that same experience of speaking in tongues, just like the Jews had when the Holy Ghost was poured out like them and just like the Samaritans had when the Holy Ghost was poured out on them. And as much as I try to avoid speculation from the pulpit, if there was a concrete takeaway from all of this, it's a lesson to learn that regardless of whatever the apparent gap was as the rapid growth and expansion of the early church took place, God is sovereign and that whatever we think should happen may not be what happens and that we should expect the unexpected and that his outpouring is not constrained by our perspective or our understanding. Amen. 
And so turning to the last part of the story this morning in Acts chapter eight, verse 17, now the apostle Peter and John have taken the 70 mile journey to Samaria and having arrived, they waste no time to preach to all the believers about the infilling of the Holy Ghost and that there'll be this initial evidence of speaking in other tongues, uttering words in a language they never learned as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. And as they preached on this precious gift from God, the Bible says they laid their hands on the Samaritans. And every person they prayed with received the gift, speaking in tongues, praying to God in a language that they never learned. Now one could ask themselves here, well, is it a requirement that someone lay their hands on me for me to receive the Spirit of God? And the answer to that is no. It's not a requirement. But when we do lay our hands, like the Bible gives us examples of, to pray for the sick or to pray words of faith that someone would receive the Spirit of God, it's symbolic of the body of Christ that's reaching out and touching that individual. We don't just go around laying hands on anybody anytime. As I approach someone at the altar and I'm, I see God is touching their heart and oftentimes you know, the lip will start to quiver or some tears start to come out the corner of their eye because they're feeling something that they can't explain. That's an indication to me to, to, to approach them and say, do you know what you're feeling? I don't know, but I'm, I, I, and I, oh, you're feeling the power of God, let me tell you. And there's no question. They knew the answer, but they just, they, they weren't sure enough to say it. And so as they're, they're having that experience, I, I say, well, have you ever had the experience of, of speaking in other tongues? And, you know, maybe they've, ever, maybe they've never even heard about that. Maybe they've heard about it, but they've never had it. Or maybe they've had it, and it's been a while, or whatever the case may be. And so as, as we're there having this experience with the power and the presence of God, and, and I can see there's something going, and there's an affirmation that that's God's spirit that's working in them, there's a very simple set of instructions that I give. I said, well, let's, let's, let's tell God what we're feeling out loud. You see, you can never be filled with the Spirit of God with the evidence of speaking in other tongues if you don't speak it out loud. And generally, we start speaking words of repentance, words that express our sorrow for the things that we know we've done that are wrong and, and words that express our need of a Savior and, and even words that start to speak to our plan not to to continue to follow that life that we once lived, even though we don't know exactly how it is, we're not gonna live it. Right. Repentance is a turning around, not just a confession, but confession is with our lips. And so as we start to confess our need of the, of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there is a power in those words. And as we, we pour out whatever we can in words of repentance, then at some point it, our words can turn to praise and thanks and thanksgiving unto God and Somewhere in there, as someone is open to that infilling of God's spirit, there is a transition from words that we know and understand to words that don't sound like anything we've ever heard before come out of our mouths. Can I tell you the thing that gets in the way most often is our own pride, our own self-conscious. Lord, I'm feeling something very powerful right now, and I, I am willing to confess with my lips my need of a savior to repent, to worship you out loud with words spoken, not just thoughts in our mind. But then as God starts to move on that individual, there is a, a trust that has to take place where I'm, gonna will, I'm willing to take a step past what I know and what's comfortable into something that I don't know that is very uncomfortable at this moment and trust that it's God who's been leading me and, and allow the sound to come out. See, God doesn't move our mouth like a puppet. He doesn't force us to speak it. But if we'll take that step, like Peter took a step out of the boat when Jesus said, come, walk on water, he didn't know how it was going to happen, but he took a step anyways. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, the steps continued to lead in the right direction. God isn't going to leave you hanging if you'll take a step. Here we read in verse 17 of Acts chapter 8, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. He offered Peter and John money, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And here within the story, there's another story about what does it truly mean to receive the Holy Ghost like Jesus promised that he would 
baptized them with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And if you, grow, if you didn't grow up in a Pentecostal church or an apostolic atmosphere, it's very likely you were taught like I was taught that the, the dwelling of God's spirit comes when a person just accepts or believes or is baptized as a child or whatever it was that we were taught and that there isn't necessarily a specific sign or, or a milestone that we can point to and say that was the day when I was born again. But if what we were taught, many of us as a child, is true, then this whole portion of scripture must be a big lie or a story. Because if it was true that just simply belief was all that was required to be filled with his spirit, then the Samaritans didn't need Peter and John to come and pray for them because they already believed. If being baptized was enough to be filled with his spirit, they were already baptized. There was no need to take an additional step. And when Peter and John did come as firsthand witnesses of God's plan to expand the church into the disenfranchised Samaritans, Whatever happened caused Simon to ask to buy that kind of power. He had already witnessed miracles. He had already witnessed signs through Philip, but something different had happened, and now he says, no, no, that's what I want. <laughs> this was not just a, something that happened behind the scenes, unknown. No, there was a sign that followed the believers. They will speak with new tongues. There is an, an evidence that God has control or has, has filled an individual taking control of the tongue, the most unruly member. What was so profound that when people received the Holy Ghost, the answer is they spoke in a language they never learned. They were filled with a power that they could feel but they couldn't see. And there was a sudden change in every person that received it. Instantly, there's a new nature that's engrafted into our nature. As we turn to our last portion of scripture here in Acts chapter 8, verse 20, here we read Peter's response to Simon's request to buy this power to lay hands on people so that they could receive the Holy Ghost. Chapter, Acts chapter 8, verse 20, but Peter said unto them, or him, thy money perish with thee. Speaking to Simon the sorcerer who has misled, propping himself up as a power of God. Thy money perish with thee, Simon, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Because your heart isn't right, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't happen without some sign that follows after it. And when Simon saw the phenomena of people being filled with the Holy Ghost, the spiritual con man thought to himself, oh, that's, that's what I need. I need to keep my status as a power of God. I need to have the authority like Peter and John had that Philip didn't have. And perhaps here's another possible scenario as to, to why no one was filled under the anointed preaching and teaching of Philip. Because perhaps, again, I'm just speculating here, perhaps if they had been filled, maybe, maybe Simon would have been able to pick up some version of the truth and propagate it to continue his lie and his legacy as he misguided the city. But now since the official apostles arrived and he witnessed something different that didn't happen before, Simon's the one that's being tricked into exposing himself as a fraud, as a con. Perhaps. This morning as the musicians will come and we read the very last scripture that completes the story in Acts chapter 8 verse 24. Simon in response to Peter's calling him out then answered Simon and said, speaking to Peter, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. For Simon's sake, I hope that those were words that led to what the Bible calls repentance. Amen. There are differing opinions on whether or not Simon's response was one of true repentance or if in fact it was a sign of his lack of repentance because he didn't take ownership of his mistake. He simply said, well, I hope the thing that you spoke doesn't come to pass, like the curses or the blessings that he probably spoke. That and while Simon may or may not have repented this morning, every one of us has an opportunity to repent. We're in a place and a time where God's 
door is wide open and that where the promises are for every believer to repent, to be born again, to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of our sins, going under the water and coming up, having a weight removed from our shoulders that was always there, that we've been carrying around, that no longer he remembers our past, that we have a fresh start. And like the people in Samaria, having been baptized, having believed, having repented, there was still another step that they had not yet experienced, like so many of us had not experienced, even though we believed in God, we believed the word of God, and had ex- even had the promises of God to come to fruition in our life, there was still more. This morning, God, if there's more for me, that's what I want. I don't, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to be able to explain it, but I want to experience it. To be filled with your spirit, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues, a language that was never learned, a heavenly language or a language of man. Only God knows. And when we have this language, this, it becomes a, a direct line of communication with God as his spirit speaks through us, for us, interceding on our behalf Amen. for his perfect will to come to pass. Amen. If you've never been baptized or if you've never had that experience of speaking another language as the spirit of God gives the utterance, the only prerequisite for either one is to repent. As I shared with that Sunday when I, God filled me with his spirit, when I had that experience for the first time, I had not yet even been baptized, but I had come to an altar, not even knowing why I was coming. And in that altar, I started to confess and repent and to take the thought that I had earlier that day, God, I think I want to do what's right. And I started to put action to it, which was just simple. And God said, that's it. That's enough. That's a door that I can walk through and I can fill you in. Somewhere as I was speaking words out loud to God, the words changed from a language I know in English to an utterance that I don't know what it was. It didn't make sense to me, but I knew there was a power and a presence of God that came with it. And that night, as a- after the time at the altar, someone came up and said, well, have you ever been baptized in Jesus' name? And I said, no, but whatever you're selling, I'm buying because this is amazing. I didn't understand it, I couldn't explain it, but God was not prevented from pouring it out into my life. And from that moment, everything changed. This morning, would you stand with me? You've come to this place because you have a belief. This is a body of believers, and we all have different stories of where we've come from and where what God has done and what we understand. And, and maybe some of us, like I did that day, understand very, very little, and that's okay. This morning, like that Sunday when the minister opened up the altar, a 21-year-old young man named Mike felt something inside to say, you should go up front. Why am I going up front? I don't know, but I just, I feel like I need to go up front. This morning, if you're feeling that tug, that's God that's tugging, that God that's directing you. And if he's directing you, there's something more for you. Every step you take is a step into the promises and the power of God. This morning, if you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the water behind me is warm. The baptism, we have robes for you to wear so you can go home with dry clothes and towels for you to dry off with afterwards. There is nothing that's preventing you except that you have repented. And if you've been baptized, if you've repented, and you have not had the experience of speaking a language you never learned, this morning, God wants to fill you to confirm the work with signs following. And so as we open up this altar this morning, I'm inviting everyone to come because we all need to repent. We all need to be filled again and again and again. And if you have not had that experience, would you would you come? Could we pray with one another, men praying with men and women praying with women that we would all be filled?